we're all trying to figure out how close are we to a point where a leader in America comes out with a set of policies and this market rejects it. How close are we to that moment? You know, John, it is, it is so reminiscent of the discussion that uh, we had even when I was on the Hill. And if you look back even 10 years ago, we were screaming the same thing, that we have reached a point of unsustainable debt levels. We have to do something about it. And I certainly agree with what both uh, Ken Griffin and Larry, Frank, uh, Larry Fink have said, that we are on an unsustainable path. I, I think, though, that the discussion around the debt and deficit is a little bit too simplistic because, yes, it's okay to have some level of debt and deficit. I think people, most people in their lives have it, and I think the government's the same. I think the trouble you get into is when you start growing that deficit more quick and the debt more quickly than you grow the economy. And there is no agreement, though, on what to do about this. And so if the parties would sort of step back and focus on growing the economy, it actually, the decisions to correct the situation would be a little bit easier, the political cost a little less, if people could just try and focus on how we're growing the economy instead of a lot of the policy that's underway in Washington. Isn't that the argument that the former administration led by President Donald Trump essentially made? that we can pile on more debt, but ultimately we're going to do it because we're pro-growth. Did that work out well? well? No, because you've got to do, you've got to address both. I mean, there's no question that it is the demographics in our country and the health care costs and the increase in those health care costs turbocharged now with higher interest rates. That's where this is this trifecta of a really toxic mix that we've got that is threatening, I think, the future. And I don't know if, if we're going to see the two candidates for president, the existing, the incumbent, and, and Donald Trump ever propose a fix to this. But I think we know how to do it. We talked about how to do it when I was there. It's interesting that you have both sides of this. You have from the policy perspective when you were in Congress, and you have now from the Wall Street perspective when you're deciding how to invest and where to allocate. How convinced are you that this time is different, that the bond market is going to wake up to the risks that you see from the fiscal side? Well, listen, I think on, on the deal-making side at Mullis, I mean, what we're seeing is clients who really reacted over the last couple of years to this volatility and uncertainty around interest rates. Um, obviously, interest rates, when you're in the deal-making business, are very, very impactful. So, you know, I do think, you know, at some point, the market is going to reject this continued incurrence of debt. I mean, we're spending a trillion seven hundred billion dollars more um, of money than we have every single year at some point. But again, I always go back to the fact that we're, quote unquote, the fastest kid on the block in this country. Where else are you going to put your money? And whether we're seeing signs of that now in diversification, I'm not sure yet. I'm not sure because when I look at it and you look at the you know, ADP report out today, we'll get the jobs report out later this week. But, you know, it, where else is there this innovation and dynamism? I mean, we're on a roll in this country where you've got more small business startups than we've ever had before. That is a signal that people are optimistic about America. If the market, though, was to push Washington's hand, because you know Washington is not going to be the ones to come up with a plan for, for the fiscal deficit, are the right people in place? You had a great relationship in 2011 with then former Vice President Biden. He spoke glowingly about you, able to work in a bipartisan fashion. Are the right people in place to actually come to the crisis? Look, I, I think that the situation will demand that people, you know, step up and come up with a solution. And there's really, to me, if you want to fix the problem and send the signal to the markets that the country and the investors in the markets, that the country is on the right path, you know, it's a simple notion, but it's difficult politically. You know, you just take the steps to change the health care entitlement, the Medicare program, from a defined benefit system to a defined contribution and basically offlay some of the risk to the beneficiaries. That's really, really tough politically. But if there were a crisis, if the markets did reject what's going on in Washington, you could take more interim steps to go in and tweak the age of retirement, to reduce uh, the indexing of benefits. Um, there are, you could means test. There are some things where you could buy and the government could buy us uh, decade plus in terms of the viability of these programs. That just doesn't win elections. Um, I want to talk about some of the proposals we are hearing from the candidates. Former President Donald Trump is talking about 10 percent tariffs, wall, a wall, and then 60 percent blanket tariffs on China. We ran the numbers and that says PC would be north of 3 percent yet again. Yeah. How, do you think he would actually do that, given the fact that this can mean 
such higher inflation, especially on everyday Americans. Well, you know, I, I think it goes back to that admonition that someone had given back in 16, you know, don't take him uh, uh, literally, take him figuratively. Who knows? Who knows what we can expect? I think the unpredictability is what he likes. Uh, and there's no question that his message is we have been taken advantage of by others, in particular China, and we need to step up and gain some leverage when we try and negotiate some resolution of this situation. But listen, there are very troubling signs coming out of China, separate and apart from the national security concerns around particularly sensitive industries. Uh, and, you know, because you think about what's going on um, with EVs and the fact that the Chinese government is well aware they've got to do something to take care of their domestic economy. So they are ramping up production in their manufacturing sector. And guess what? They're going to have so much excess that now they're already looking like they're sort of dumping all those into Europe and the EV situation, very, very concerning. And our OEMs here are equally, I think, as concerned that that may happen. When it comes to a deal-making perspective, how much are you avoiding cross-border deals because of some of these questions and concerns? Well, you know, I, I think it's very interesting because so much of the sectors um, that investors will look to Really, we're shining in the U.S., and there's a lot of European, Asian, Middle East investors who are looking to allocate their capital here in the U.S., but of course, there are political ramifications to monies coming in, and we've seen that when it comes to countries that are not aligned with us, whether it's China um, or, or someone else who is just not on the favored list. You have to go through the hoops with CFIUS and things like that. But I think the real concern that, you know, I continue to hear from clients of MOAs and others is the fact that we've got a situation with our antitrust regulators um, that it's not just applicable to cross-border deals, it's applicable to every deal. And I think what Lena Khan, Jonathan Cantor have done at both FTC and DOJ has been such a stretch in terms of interpreting the law and the antitrust law. And, and they've, I think, done a disservice to our country, to investors, and frankly, damaging the competitiveness of America as a destination for capital. That's the world we live in right now. We were talking to Brian Moynihan just the other week on the trading floor of Bank of America. Had a similar complaint. He was talking about the amount of deals that were being held back by the prospect of them just not being able to pass, not being able to go through. And no one wanted to be on the wrong side of that being left to hang out to dry for a year without any idea of whether the deal will close or not. Are you seeing the same thing? Potential deals that could close that just aren't being made I, right now. You know, I, I do think, and what, what I will uh, say to decision makers um, is that, you know, if we're going to go forward, if there's going to be a deal to, uh, to, to work, we're going to have to make sure that we allocate the necessary time, resources and commitment to get through that process. But think about it. If we like to be the, the location in the world where capital flows to its most efficient use, where it's the most dynamic economy, velocity of capital, we shouldn't have to do this. And unfortunately, there is just an overwhelming ideolo ideology that's infecting the policy. Uh, in the current administration in Washington um, that is not necessarily that favorable. Um, but again, all the while, you look to and say, where else um, or is it any better? Let me ask you this, though. Is that ideology infecting both parties? Because right on cue, deal crosses the Bloomberg terminal, we announce it, we talk about it, we go to the Twitter account of the senator of Massachusetts, tweet, shock. Not surprised yeah. at all. What is surprising is the amount of Republicans that agree with her now. Yep. That's a shift. And I'm trying to work out, do we actually have a business-friendly party in Washington anymore? Does one exist? Well, listen, I always like to say I'm a limited government, pro-free market, pro-national security, conservative Republican. But I agree, Jonathan, with your, with your sentiment that Donald Trump has changed the nature of the Republican Party. We are, I believe now, um, perceived as the working class party. Um, and the Democratic Party has done more to ingratiate itself with quote unquote the elite and the very and, and the very far left on the ideological spectrum and somehow the extremes are meeting uh, and you're seeing this happen and I worry about this because this extreme push in terms of government role in the economy has happened with the support of both parties. You look at the IRA bill, certainly that was one party that was the Democratic Party, but if you look at the CHIPS bill, uh, look what that look what that did. I mean, that was industrial policy focused on a particular industry that folks in my party decided was a good thing for national security. So let's let the government go all in. That is not sort of the limited government uh, outlook that you see. 
Uh, and so you're right, there is a shift towards labor. Uh, labor is um, in the polling, public polling in this country at an all-time high in terms of favorability. Uh, and um, both parties, you've seen it. How in the world can a White House go and join the picket lines? That's what President Biden did. But you know what? So did Donald Trump. So did several Republican senators join the picket lines in Detroit. Well, to Jonathan's point, J.D. Vance, who is a VP shortlist candidate, literally came out and said he thinks Lena Khan is maybe the only effective person in the Biden administration. So say it was to be Trump. Are you getting the same sort of DOJ, same sort of FTC? I, see, and I, you know, that's, that's the real question as to whether we're going to continue to see the extremity. I don't buy that because I still think there is a DNA. But you're, you're, you're a product of that extremity. You lost your seat because of that. And that populist wave that people said, you were really the beginning of it. But, but, but remember where the anger was. The anger really was against the so-called establishment. It wasn't necessarily towards, um, you know, it was, it was towards everything. We thought and probably assigned an overweight uh, to the import of profligate spending in Washington. I think it was just more, it is about the establishment, the system, etc. I don't necessarily think people are going to the polls in, in November based on antitrust regulation. I really don't. <laughs> so I, I think that where you're going to have uh, manifest in a next Republican Trump administration is more of the DNA that's a little bit more balanced and not so punitive on corporates. People might not be going to the polls, but you have to plan a business around it. And that's really one of the key questions. And we keep getting people in here saying, uh, Lori Calvacina, it's like staring at the sun. How do you plan for something that feels like it is shifting and you don't know exactly how? Is there any way that you are planning with the business and the deal making to get ahead of whatever kind of push we're going to get in November? So I, I just think that we've got to be very mindful in 2025, there will be the Super Bowl of fiscal policy debate because you've got expiration of the Trump tax cuts. And some would say, well, not all of them. Well, yes, there will be. Everything will be on the table. Uh, and just to extend the lower, uh, uh, the $400,000 and under uh, income bracket, that's a $3.2 trillion issue. You talk about the debt, fiscal year 23, we were at $791 billion of interest cost, and we're going up. Uh, and so everything's going to be on the table. IRA, the subsidies, I can, I would say if there's any anticipation and advice I would give for those who have been on the uptake in terms of these subsidies um, with the IRA, especially as it relates to EVs and the renewable industries, we better take a real look to see whether we think those will continue because they're going to be on the table too. I believe my party uh, will first up look at some of those subsidies and get rid of them. So final question for you trying to work this all out, because I think this is really, really difficult. In 2016, we had a candidate, and I think if you could divorce the person from the policy, the policy you looked at was pro-business, low taxes, confrontation at some point with China. And then TikTok happened in the last couple of weeks, and I was just thinking, is the Trump template from volume one applicable to volume two? Do you think <laughs> it is? I, I do. I don't think that he has changed much in terms of his career trajectory. He's always been anti-China. He's always tried to go and gain some leverage in negotiations. He's a deal maker. I also think that he is focused on a growing economy. I think at the end of the day, with all the noise you see from J.D. Vance coming together with, with Elizabeth Warren and what have you, at the end of the day, the Trump administration next time will be pro-business because he'll want to see a growing economy.